Okay, hello everyone. I'm so excited today um, to have a great host with me, Dr. Gia. I've been watching her videos on YouTube for a while and she answers all of my questions when it comes to research. And that's why I wanted uh, to host her on my channel today because like one of the things, once you start residency, it's research. So she will tell us all about it. Welcome, Dr. Gia. Hi, thank you so much, Ruben, for having me here. It's wonderful. Oh my God, it's a pleasure. Um, so let's say, let's put ourselves like, uh, I'm like right now in my fourth year of international residency. Let's say I just started my residency and I'm really excited to do research. It's July 1st, it's a new beginning. I wanna do research. I have like lots of dreams for fellowship. I wanna publish hundreds of papers. When and where should I start? What should I do? Tell me. So I would say, if you can, start within the first year itself because re a, a proper research project does take some time, especially when you need to do data collection. So that first project is meant for the seed for final, maybe it gets published in the third year. But I don't want you to think, oh, if I do that work, I only get to publish in the third year, then I have nothing until then. You need to stack a few projects along the way and stack a few publications along the way so that you can have a nice big project at the end. But in the meantime, you have smaller things from in year one, year two, year three. Okay. So some people also like say, maybe you should wait for the first four or five months just to get the clinical skills and to know how the system works. But like, what do you think about that? I agree with that because the first few months really is getting efficient first, you know, know, know the hospital, you know where, how to find the wards, how to find the bathroom, where, where the cafeteria is. You, you need the basic first before you jump into a, a new thing because research and academic writing is a completely different skill. So you don't want to overwhelm yourself with learning too many things. So you want to be good at one thing first, just get the efficiency right, know where the things are, then you start doing your clinical skills, then once about four or five months, you, you start to get a hang of things, then you can push the limit a little bit and start, okay, let me think about potential projects. You have some breathing space in your mind to think about things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. I think the hardest months of my residency were the first three months. I just like figured things out, how to use Epic, how to use electronic medical records. Yes. Um, and like minor things, like where are the washrooms at the hospital? Where is the cafeteria? You always get lost, especially if you're working in multiple hospitals. So I completely agree with you with that. So let's say like it's now, uh, it's around like November, December. And the first year is going well. I familiarize myself with the hospital. I know how to use the EMR. Uh, I'm getting on hang of the things, but like I want to start research now. What should I do? Should I just like email people randomly? Should I ask my friends? Like it's, it's a big word. Like what should be my next step? Right. Um. I would say start, absolutely, you can email people, yeah? Don't don't be worried about cold emails because um, attendings are always looking for people who are interested. They are not gonna force a project to somebody who is overwhelmed with clinical work or maybe not interested in research. So they will only give projects to residents who show a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of interest. So first, if you're the first one who email your uh, attending, your supervisor, First, they know you, number one. And number two, they know you're interested. And now you're planted a seed in their mind, like, oh, if I have an interesting thing, I, I will call Ruben first. I will call GF first instead of just any other random student or a resident. So that is one first thing to do is email and say, you know, I'm interested in projects. Um, and and don't, don't just say, do you have anything for me? They, they don't have anything for you um, because... If you're new to research, it is a lot of work to like train you from the beginning. So when you want to say, oh, I am interested, but I want to learn from you, is there a project where um, I can uh, just tag along and, and learn the process? That is fine. You know, they are okay. Typically, attendings are generous. They, they want to help you. So if you, you go there saying, I want to learn something and learn the process, it's not too much work for them. And you get to learn and see the things at the same time. Usually, that that's a good way to start. And um, as for topics, um, you can talk to your um, supervisors, but I, I think it always should come from you, where what's your interest first? 
in the sense like uh, your your personal experience, where you think you want to go in five years. If if you want to become an oncologist, then maybe think about the topic, narrow it down first. Let, let's think about oncology. You want to go cardiology, you think about cardiology project. Don't, um, so, so that is one way to narrow it down. And then you find cardiology mentors, uh, a few research mentors to talk through the ideas. And before you even do that, you, you want to start doing some literature, you start reading up articles, have a little bit of basic understanding of how research uh, papers are designed and read, that, that way you can actually have a proper conversation with your supervisor. Okay. But like one of the things is when you start, like there are many attendings. How do you think as a new resident, I can find the attending who publishes a lot? Because like we hear a lot of people who do lots of work in research and they end up like not publishing or the all their work like goes to waste or like they, they, they end up learning. But like how as a resident, I can find that mentor who is who does have the time to teach me and who does have academic productivity. Right, right. So I think some of, one of the mistakes is um, the resident getting attached to one who is just based on productivity or they go the other route. Oh, this, this attending is, uh, is really good at teaching cardiology. Then they think automatically it's a research, researcher. So that the cardiologist who's good at cardiac care is not going to be good at writing paper or designing a project. So usually that, that kind of falls into the mistakes, going to the raw mentor. And the second problem is also sometimes um, you, you are trying to choose only one, one perfect mentor. Usually there's no one perfect mentor. Each mentor has slightly different skills they're good at. Some are good at writing. Some are good at project planning. Some are good at um, uh, uh, designing a project and some are very good at finding the gap, you know? So you have to learn that if I go to this mentor and you realize that, oh, they are not really good at teaching writing, then you need to find somebody who is good at writing. So, so I typically have a committee of mentors. I say, okay, this person is really the goal is to just a content expert good at narrowing the, 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 the ideas. This one is good when I want to talk about, oh, um, how to manage the project. So sometimes one or two may be really good at doing quite a few things, but sometimes you actually need more than one. Okay. So because one of the misperceptions like people have in residency, and I, I, did have, I did have that too, like you go to residency and you think you should have only one mentor and you can't have many mentors. Like one of the things that I found that useful, like one of the things that I learned from one of the senior residents, that she had a mentor, even not only for research, like even for lifestyle, like right. how to live healthy, how to take care of yourself. And those things are not easy. So don't be afraid to have many mentors, especially in research. Research is a big, big beast. It's not easy. And that's why I have Dr. Jia there to show us like what to do and how to approach this. Okay. So it's not wrong to have many mentors and it's advisable to have many mentors. Okay. So let's say I go to my mentor and we start talking about like different projects. You all know the types of studies, but like which type of study do you think? Like my, I go to my mentor and he says like, we have this prospective study. We have the random mass clinical trial. We have basic science and we have like a meta-analysis going. I have those four projects, choose one. Which mm. one do you think is doable in residency? And it's easy to start with just to understand how research is done. So cohort studies, let's say it's a prospective cohort study, that that I, I would not recommend it because it's gonna take so much time. It takes so much time to, to build the cohort. It takes time to follow up by the time, you know, they're thinking about five years, six year follow up. By then you would have been one of the small people who were involved in the beginning and then they forgot about you. So unless you're more at the end, they are almost wrapping up the things and they have the data. They just want somebody to come work together. Yeah, absolutely. But if it's like the very beginning and um, it's not gonna, by the time you finish, you're probably not gonna be uh, an author. Though I would not say don't do it. It's just, you need to know, have realistic expectation that if I join this, my goal is to learn the beginning of this so that when I become a proper researcher later, I want to learn the beginning process, but but do realize that I may not be able to get a publication. Second thing is join because I want to have a network 
of researchers around me. So, so that is one possible way. So certain output doesn't always mean publication, but network for your future collaborators. So that's one. Fast ones are typically cross-sectional studies. So think about your um, survey. So you create a survey or use a validated survey and then you give it to medical student, maybe give it to resident, give it to patient. Those are fast. So those are good resident projects. The third type, meta-analysis and systematic review. Um, you can start, but you need a lot more guidance. Meta-analysis on the surface is just, oh, we, we have existing data. But the issue is, how do you find the articles? Are you doing it in a non-biased way? And when you do, how do you analyze that and, and analyze it well? So that is the part that it, it takes a lot more skill. And usually even researchers who, who are not subspecialized in that analysis are not strong in that method. So, so you wanna make sure if you are gonna do that project, have a mentor who is good at that method. Gotcha, yeah, I just wanna also add on that, like one of the research projects that I started in my almost second year of residency was a survey. Um, Despite it's fast, like it took us two years, I'm involved in one of the projects that uh, evaluated the quality of uh, virtual care during the COVID-19 pandemic in Ontario and Eastern region. And it took us around two years, but we have like 9,000 survey results. So wow. even surveys take lots of time, but I think it's one of the best studies uh, to do. And uh, another project I'm involved in is like surveying a fellowship program directors for internal medicine about factors that are important for residents uh, what they look for for residents where they take them to the fellowship program uh, in their application, their research productivity and their academic productivity. So that's another survey I'm involved in. So those are very dual. I completely echo that. And yes, I agree with you. Um, and um, what about like, do you think there are also like some small quality improvement projects? What do you think about those? So I, I love quality improvement projects because um, it's contained. It's contained within, within the, the institution. And so um, it's easier in a way that the numbers are smaller. The only issue is publication. It takes a little bit more uh, work because you want to make sure you use the right process. Just because you do um, a project in a hospital but never use the proper method, it doesn't qualify as a qual quality, uh, quality improvement project. So you want to do a project, always think in an intention, how do I get it published? Just with that little mindset shift, it changes how you plan your project. Because then, then you don't just, oh, let me start a project, let me do this and do that, and then realize, oh, I can't really publish it because it wasn't designed properly. So just take an extra step, it, it, extra step of thinking about the research protocol, making sure you are analyzing quality improvement, you know, look at journal articles that are quality improvement projects so that you know, oh, they always want a framework. Then you, you design your project with a framework in mind so that now you can say, okay, we did this project, we have a framework and then we can publish it. If not, you're just wasting a lot of time thinking to publish, but not really. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Uh, doing a project and then finding out you did it the wrong way, it's horrible. It feels so bad. Yes. Um, but like one of the things the usual academic centers have, they have like a method center. Like for me in Ottawa, we have the Ottawa Method Center. And they've been so great with me. Like every project I start, I just like consult them. And as residents, you have free access to their services. So usually if you are in an academic center, you always remember to ask what are available resources for residents because like they can link you to a statistician or a methodologist who can make your life much easier. Okay. This is such a great point because yeah. I, I know your, your institution has that, that is wonderful. There are many institutions that do not have that, but you have to learn how to be resourceful and look for oh, maybe that's a quality improvement center or maybe one researcher in the whole institution who does quality improvement, for, like find a person and, and talk to them. What's the few things you need to do before you start. So that that is great, great. Um, exactly, yeah. design it right or not gonna be published. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, okay, so one of the things also I found in my residency is like, in the beginning of residency, we are so excited and we start asking right and left, right and left. And then suddenly 10 people offers you projects. What should I do? Should I say no? Should I say yes? And how should I, how should I say no? And how to choose between these? Okay. Um, so my, my advice is going to be a little bit out of 
uh, the, the common answer. People usually say, oh, learn to say no, learn to say no, learn to say no. I, I'm more like, we actually have a lot more capacity than we believe. So if you can push yourself a little bit, push yourself a little bit, that's number one. Number two, I chose my projects. Um, I, I have a decision tree in my mind. So I make a lot of decision ahead of time before the situation comes. So I have my, I currently I am a 75% researcher, so clinician scientist. So at this stage of my life, I don't take any case report anymore. I only do original research. So in my mind, I said, okay, at this stage, I only want original research. The type of research I want must be core study or randomized controlled trial. If I am going to take a, a project that is not towards my um, my interest is in acute kidney injury. And if, if it's outside of that, I will probably say no. If it is outside of that, but it has an opportunity for a big collaboration in the future or an opportunity for um, a new study method that I get to learn, then I will say yes. So these are kind of my threshold of what I'm going to say yes to. So you have to decide what are you going to say yes or no to ahead of time. Like maybe at this stage, I've only published case report. So my next stage is I want to do a prospective study if I can. If I want to join somebody who is doing, uh, uh, oh, they've completed, but I want to do a lot of the writing. Or I want to be at the beginning stage because I want to learn the process of designing the project. So you, in your mind, you decide what you want. And when people give you the project, you say, oh, this meets my criteria. I'm going to take it. Gotcha, gotcha. I think, yeah, I think this is important. Different people have different ways of approaching things and you should have like, I, I think this is very nice way to think about this. You should think ahead of time of what you wanna be involved in. I completely agree with that. That's a good way to look at things. Okay, so the other question is, why should I do research residency? Residency can be so tough and so busy. And you are on call, you are doing those 26 hour call shifts. We still do them in Canada. And you have like four to five calls. Like, why I don't enjoy my time out of the hospital? Like, what do you think research will uh, help me in my career? And is research right for me to do or not to do research? That is the question. Right. So it, it depends on your career goals. So if your career is going to be mostly if you're thinking maybe academic clinician even though it's not like a um not like me 75 maybe just 25 percent research i would recommend doing a few research projects because you get to a better fellowship program why is that it's because doing a research project and publishing paper requires a lot of skill and it's a lot of skill beyond the clinical work so that means Program directors think, ah, this person is a finisher. They do things beyond what's expected, and they are um, they are go givers, you know. So so go getters. So they they see you differently because you did something extra, not 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 by default, not what everybody does. So it, it puts you up in a slightly different stage. Uh, the program director looks at you differently. So that's the first thing. Second thing is um, it has many transferable skills. So you may think, oh, research project is just paper publication, but it actually involves project management, uh, selling, because you have to sell the story, writing. Um, you have to uh, think about dissemination. So these are skills that when you become you know, the big CMO or the leadership in a hospital, these are kind of transferable skills and think about designing projects uh, and, and bringing it through all the way. These are skills that you need as a leader. Um, so you have to think about it just on uh, tangibles and also the intangible. And then the third thing on why you should publish is because it's to build authority. So you may be at a residency stage and you may not be thinking about your name and prestige and authority. But once you get out, you want to build a name for yourself. So you want to be a Ruben, the what, what, what person, Gia, the AKI person. You know, it's another person who is the uh, on call. Uh, uh, nephro, nephro oncology. So everybody has this little thing. And in order to build authority, I like to use the word, you know, authority comes from the word author. And when you have author, when you're a published author, and the more you have, the more authority you, you build. So of course, there are other ways of building authority, but publishing paper is one of those that really solidifies you as a, an expert. Gotcha. 
Okay. So also one of the things I want to discuss with you is like, uh, we think that research is a one person show. I come up with a question, I approach a mentor, I go and do the review, and then I do the systematic review by myself and then extract it by myself. And then like I write the paper by myself and this will take me years. I'm talking from experience. Yes. What do you think is the best way to be productive and work in teams as a researcher. So I want to really emphasize working in teams as a researcher. Absolutely. I, I, I've fallen into this trap, you know, first project, doing every single thing myself, and it took like forever. So, right, research is actually a team sport and not a solo endeavor. That's the first thing. If you see the most productive people or in that niche, you're going to see the same name of, of authors in that group, and then it's just switching position. So when you start reading people, you're like, oh, I it's agree. the same number I of people. <laughs> like first author, senior author, second, it, it's like they, they switch position. Yes. So what happens is when you have this ultimate group, you, you become very powerful because you are going to eventually, if you if you find a beautiful group, you're going to have um, one who is skillful, skillful in um, designing projects. One is skillful in creating graphics like beautiful tables and like beautiful figures another one is oh they are intuitive they, they know how to think about the discussion another one will be good at this so so it's like a dream team so usually those are the most productive then it's not just a skill but also the type of people in a team you need three types one is the starter the person who starts something then you need the worker bee because you need the person who like Will get things done when you tell them to do they, they they will they will not meet they will always meet the deadline they will give the edit in time they will give you all the revision in time and then you need the final person who is the pusher the one who's like hey can we get this done can we submit this now everybody's like oh hold on hold on it's not done but this this person is the one who pushes Oops. so so you need so you need different type of people in your team that way then everybody works very 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 well yeah, I completely agree with you. And don't do this mis mistake. I did it by myself. I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm a perfectionist. All of us are. In medicine, I was like, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Like, no, it does not work this way. Research, it's a team game. Uh, and the most published people are those who know how to interact with other people and bring groups together. Okay. Right. Sounds good. I also want to mention, yes. you know, um, as a team, so sometimes is you, you may not know how to delegate um the the, mm -hmm. the test yeah. so especially when you have one really senior one and then you have the middle one and then you have medical students who have uh, or, or residents who have no experience and then you don't know what to do with them so i would always say talk to them and, and know their skills find out what they're good at okay even if they're very junior and has no experience you can ask them to do things like formatting tables or do proofreading or look up papers on, oh, I want you to look at papers that is all on um, the prevalence of diabetes. You know, just give them a small task. Or I want you to look at the journal and look at all the submission guidelines. So, so these are the tasks that you could still delegate and they feel involved with the project. And, and sometimes after a while, they start learning and then they can start contributing more. So don't just think that a junior person can't contribute. You have to be creative and thinking, oh, you know, these are the things that maybe I can, let them try. Yes, I completely agree with you. Like one of the surveys that I'm working on, I just like found medical students to help me to distribute the survey, send emails. And right. I involve them in every step. Like I will share with them all the emails because like I'm the one responsible of submitting the IRB in my institution and writing the paper and doing the literature review. I involve in every step because like I'm trying to teach them as well. So see one, teach one and do one. That's uh, the goal in medicine, right? So I right, right. You. Yes. yes, you can do that in research too. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> exactly. Okay, I think those are my questions. Are there any last tips do you want to give for people who are in residency and starting research right now? Um, any last words? So I think my last words are, don't be too intimidated by research. Um, it, it is a big, big thing, but it's all the small skills. Uh, think of research skill as many, many tiny micro skills and academic writing it's also many 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 tiny writing skills so even though at the beginning you feel like oh it's it, i'm not good I, i'm taking really long just realize every time every small improvement you are building on your skills on your research 
So that's my kind of general advice. But my second advice is if you are really serious in research, let's say you are, don't do the same projects over and over again. You know, I've seen people who, who fall into a trap of, oh, I, I, I published 10 case reports. You know, it is not, it's not very meaningful anymore. If you can do 10 case reports, why not just stick to the first five and then the next five, do something a little bit different. Each time try to do something a bit different. Like, uh, let me give you an example, okay? My first project was, uh, I believe it was a cross-sectional study. The next one, I'm like, okay, I, I want a little bit more statistics. I want to do logistic regression. The next one, I'm like, okay, that's, that's not, not enough. I want to follow the patient and look, like, look at their survival. So now this, this time I changed the method. I, I have something a little bit more because each time I'm learning a new skill, but um, then and now I have tools in my tool belt. Next time I can decide whatever I want based on the research question, but this is your growing stage. Try, yourself, try your best to get into a project where you get to learn different components of the project to build your skill. Exactly, I completely agree with that. Um... So I think we are at the end. Thank you so much for all these information. And I hope, I'm sure this video will help people who are starting a residency, especially international graduates who are starting now. And the, we, we hear lots about research and then we get into residency and then we get overwhelmed by research. Research is amazing field. Uh, it takes some time. Uh, from my experience, it took me a year and a half just to figure things out. Um, but now I'm so glad that I took that time. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Gia, and watch her channel. She has an amazing channel, amazing research tips, and she has a course also coming soon, which I'm so excited uh, to watch as well. Um, I signed up for her newsletter, amazing newsletter, amazing research uh, tips and tricks. I, I'm really big fan of Dr. Gia. So sign up for her YouTube channel, sign up for her newsletter. She's an amazing person. Thank you so much, Dr. Gia. Thank you so much, Roberta.